Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long Webinar. So today we are very happy to have the Professor David Holtz. Uh, David Holtz is an assistant professor in the management of organizations and entrepreneurship and innovation groups at the Haas School of Business School at West Berkeley. Uh, he's also a research affiliate at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and faculty affiliate at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Professor Holtz's research broadly focuses on the design of online marketplaces and platforms. Prior to graduate school, he worked full-time as a data scientist at Silicon Valley, most recently at Airbnb. Uh, Professor Holtz has published in several, several leading the peer-reviewed journals, including Marketing Science, Science Advances, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So today, he's going to talk about his paper, Do Incentives to Review Help the Market? Evidence from a Field Experiment on Airbnb. Uh, yeah, David, you have four years. You have one hour. Yeah. All right, great. Um, well, let me get this uh, set up. All right, um, just want to make sure this looks OK. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Sungwoo, for the uh, for the invite and the introduction. Thank you, everyone else, um, for attending. Uh, super excited to be here today to talk to you about this paper, um, which, as uh, Sungwoo mentioned, is um, about the incentivized review program that Airbnb um, experimentally rolled out uh, for about two years, um, from 2014 to 2016. Um, this paper is forthcoming at Marketing Science. So uh, we actually just reviewed the proofs and sent them back in last week. So uh, there's essentially a finished draft of the paper online. Um, but if you are the type of person who prefers to read a nicely typeset uh, paper that looks like it's from an academic journal, uh, that's coming uh, soon as well. Um, and I should note uh, before getting into the talk itself, that this is joint work with my co-author, Andre Fradkin, who's a uh, professor of marketing at BU um, in the Questrom School of Business there. All right, um, so to uh, quickly set the stage, and uh, I have references throughout these slides, but these references are very much incomplete. So uh, if you um, would like sort of a more thorough literature review, I'd really encourage you to go look at the paper itself. Um, so the, the subject of, uh, of this paper uh, our reputation systems in online marketplaces, particularly peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces like um, Airbnb or eBay or Uber. Um, these reputation systems are ubiquitous in the digital economy. Uh, they're used by most, if not all, two-sided uh, matching markets. Um, but they have a number of imperfections, which have been uh, pretty uh, rigorously documented in the research literature and economics and, uh, and management and business. So um, one of the, the biggest imperfections of these systems, uh, which is sort of pointed out in this paper by Avery and co-authors, is that there's no explicit incentive for people to submit reviews at all and especially to submit informative reviews. So the reviews that people leave on these platforms are um, essentially public goods. Um, Steve Tadellis has a really nice review paper that looks at a, a number of different biases that exist in these reputation systems. And a lot of them do stem from this fact that the reviews that people live, uh, that, that the reviews that people leave are voluntary and they are public goods. So uh, for instance, uh, there's this paper by Delaricus and Wood that shows that the probability that people leave feedback depends on the quality of the transaction they have. So when it's a, a high quality transaction, people are more likely to review. And if they have a, uh, you know, a bad uh, stay in the case of Airbnb or a bad um, transaction on eBay, they're less likely to leave a review. Um, Andre and I, uh, along with our co-author Elena Graywall, um, show in a different paper that uh, these types of systems, depending on how they're designed, can suffer from uh, strategic considerations that sort of skew the types of feedback that people leave. Uh, our paper looks specifically at reciprocity and retaliation. So, you know, post-transaction, um, I might leave my transaction partner a positive review in the hopes that I can induce a positive review back. Um, similarly, I might not leave a negative review, even if I had a negative experience, if I'm fearful of retaliation. So the person might leave a negative review back to me um, in retaliation for my sort of honest negative review. Um, there's also selection effects in terms of matching. Uh, this is documented in this Nosco and Tadella's paper. So even just the types of people that match with a particular seller are sort of selected for the types of people that maybe want to engage with that seller. And so we might get sort of a a biased estimation of the quality of a seller because of this uh, these selection effects and matching. Um, and then uh, there's also this reputation inflation 
dynamic that um, is documented in this uh, paper by Apostolos Philippus and co-authors. And so they kind of look at uh, data from Upwork over time and sort of show that there's this upward ratcheting effect where platform-wide, the average view gets higher and higher and higher, in part because the buyers who are reviewing the sellers uh, sort of internalize the uh, the downstream consequences of the feedback that they're leaving and are more and more hesitant to leave any type of negative feedback. Um, one potential solution for, uh, you know, the sort of core problem of uh, reviews being public goods and there being no incentive to leave reviews, and then uh, perhaps all of these sort of downstream problems is to pay users for reviews. And that's going to be kind of the, uh, the focus of this particular work. Um, Incentivized reviews appear in a variety of different contexts, for instance, in a lot of um, e-commerce contexts. So if you look at programs like the uh, the Amazon Vine program, where Amazon incentivizes uh, shoppers to leave reviews in exchange for a few items, uh, there's other programs like Walmart has a, a program they call Spark. Target has one called Bullseye. Um, I apologize for having all sort of very US-centric examples here, but I'm guessing there are analogs to these types of programs in China. But in general, there's just many examples online of um, incentives in order for uh, consumers or you know, users on these two-sided platforms to leave reviews. Um, down at the bottom of the slide, um, this is an example uh, from an email sent to a user of a, an e-commerce website called the Girlfriend Collective. And this is kind of just, um, you know, a, like a an example of what one of these uh, solicitations might look like. So you're seeing uh, the user being told, you know, if you leave a review, you can earn 50 points in your collective account. Uh, the more points you earn, you can get early access and discounts and free stuff. So sometimes there's a point system like this. Sometimes it's a coupon. Sometimes it's some other sort of benefit, but but these incentives are always coming at some cost to the firm. Um, there has been previous work on um, incentivizing reviews in uh, e-commerce and online marketplace uh, sort of settings um, to sort of hit some of the you know the sort of um, headlines that these papers. Uh, discover. Um, so there's papers like this one by uh, Gord Birch and co-authors, and they find that, um, as you would expect, these types of incentives and also just behavioral nudges are, in fact, effective at uh, inducing reviews. So if you give someone an incentive or if you remind them to leave the review, uh, unsurprisingly, they do, in fact, uh, leave reviews more often. Not everyone leaves a review, but um, you have more compliers, so to speak. Um, there's also uh, research by uh, Marinescu and co-authors and, and other papers as well. Um, I think this is also discussed in this Birch and co-authors uh, paper. But uh, it turns out to be the case that um, typically those reviews that are induced by these incentives or these nudges are also more likely to contain info about these low quality transactions, or in the case of Airbnb, these low quality stays. So like I said earlier, uh, you know, there's sort of selection in terms of who reviews, and these incentivized reviews do um, actually, you know, yield some more of those three or two or one star reviews. Um, and then I just want to quickly note that there is also um, a number of papers um, by Lee and, and different sets of co-authors that look at um, incentivized review programs where the incentive is actually being offered by the seller uh, as opposed to the platform. Um, I believe at least some of these uh, papers are conducted um, in partnership maybe with uh, e-commerce sites or um, two-sided markets in China. Um, and uh, you know the the incentives being offered by the sellers actually introduce some interesting wrinkles because there's some you know fun questions around what that means in terms of uh, the seller signaling quality or something like that. So it's a related concept, but sort of distinct from the focus of this paper, uh, which are going to be incentives that are offered by the platform or the market. And so um, you know, relative to all this work that I'm sort of briefly discussing here, that looks at um, the fact that, you know, the incentives do, in fact, uh, elicit more reviews, those reviews are more negative, so on and so forth. Um, the, the sort of focus of this paper is, do these incentivized reviews actually help markets become more efficient? Do they actually aid market outcomes? So um, it's one thing for an incentive to actually induce more reviews, and even for that incentive to induce reviews that are more negative on average. Um, but in order for it to be uh, sort of economically viable for an online marketplace like Airbnb to incentivize those reviews, they want to know that those incentivized reviews lead to more transactions or um, better matches or, you know, some other type of increase in an outcome that they care about, such that the cost benefit analysis is going to work out that um, offering the incentives is uh, economically rational. Um, the way that we're going to try to answer that question, yeah. Oh, can I ask you one yeah, simple question? Yes. 
are there any reason we can think of why having more review, incentivized review will be bad for market efficiency? Yeah, unless the reviewers will lie. Uh, could you uh, repeat the question? I just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand. Yeah, so so you, yeah, you you question you you asked the question about question about to incentivize the review actually help the market. So, are there any reasons we can think of why it would be make market more inefficient? You know, unless yeah, reviewers actually lie, yeah, incentivized uh, reviewers lie. Yeah, um, it's a good question. So um, to sort of spoil the, the talk a little bit, okay. it's going to end up being the case that in this particular experiment, uh, the reviews do not um, help Airbnb's market become more efficient. So um, there are a few different reasons and uh, some of those are kind of idiosyncratic um, to the particular um, setting. So uh, one example is, or one reason is uh, something that I think you just sort of mentioned in asking the question, which is that even though the reviews that are induced by the incentive are more negative, if you sort of just look at, you know, what's the star rating of those reviews, um, we do some analyses that suggest that the reviews are actually more inflated conditional on the, uh, the sort of quality of the underlying stay. So yes, there are more three, two, and one star reviews, but as far as we can tell, they should probably be even lower than they are. So um, the reviews are a little bit more inflated than the unincentivized reviews. And so um, that has sort of negative implications on uh, subsequent match quality. So that actually leads uh, you know, subsequent future guests to those hosts to be less likely to return to the platform. Um, and then uh, the particular um, incentivized review treatment that we're studying um, targets a specific subset of hosts. And I think that in conjunction with the market conditions on Airbnb uh, and also the details of how Airbnb's uh, review system aggregates and displays reviews means that the incentivized reviews that are collected don't actually really move the needle in terms of the, uh, like, there's not much information gain uh, for the users of the platform, if that oh. makes sense. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on that later in the talk. Um, I think a related question, which is kind of the question that we started with, but um, is just not the question that we ended with, given the way that the paper went, is instead of asking, do they help markets become more efficient, you could ask, okay, uh, certainly they're going to, you know, increase efficiency some amount, like we, we might expect reasonably to your point that in a lot of cases they will, but even so you would want to ask, is the cost benefit analysis such that it makes sense to incentivize them? So are the efficiency gains large enough to justify the cost of the incentives? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Actually, this is kind of a good moment to pause. Okay, uh, great. So um, so the way that we uh, try to get at this question of, you know, what are the effects of these incentivized reviews on market efficiency is to look at a field experiment that was conducted on Airbnb um, that actually incentivizes guests to leave reviews of hosts. So um, this is a large scale field experiment that was run on the entire platform uh, for about two years. So from 2014 to 2016, um, our sample size is quite large. So um, the N is about 692,000. Um, and the treatment here is that guests that were staying with non-reviewed sellers were offered a $25 USD coupon uh, in exchange for submitting a review. Um, there were a few requirements that um, needed to be satisfied in order for that coupon uh, to be offered. So one is just that the listing had to have been booked. Um, this is kind of just a very mechanistic thing that in order for there to be a guest that even had the option of reviewing the listing, they need to have stayed in the listing, right? So this intervention is kind of by definition only targeting Airbnb listings that were able to get a booking with no reviews. Because had they not been, they just would not have been in a position to have a guest who has offered this incentive. Um, the treatment also targeted uh, Airbnb uh, listings that had no prior reviews. So um, in a sense, what this treatment is doing is a little bit more specific and fine grained than the overall question of, you know, um, what happens if you just incentivize reviews uh, willy nilly. Uh, we're looking specifically at incentivizing reviews for guests, or sorry, for hosts that do not have any reviews. Um, if anything, you would expect us to bias our estimates upward because that's sort of the subset of listings and hosts for whom, you know, that one review should be most impactful. 
Um, and then we uh, the incentive is only offered to guests who do not review within the first eight or nine days of the uh, review period. So for much of the duration of this experiment, uh, both guests and hosts after an Airbnb stay has finished uh, have 14 days to leave a review of one another. And so, uh, you know, at the eight to nine day mark, um, guests who had not yet reviewed were sent an email, um, you know, incentivizing them to leave a review in exchange for a coupon. Uh, Sorry, control... uh, just a, a quick question. Um, how yeah. many uh, guests usually leave within that um, period, that eight to nine day period? Um, it's a good question. Um, I forget the exact, you know, the exact response to your question, but I can tell you that platform wide, uh, the guest review rate uh, hovers around 70%. So about 70% of guests leave a review. Uh, and as you'd expect, the, the sort of temporal distribution of that is that most of them happen very close to the trip and then it kind of tails off. So, um, you know, if I had the guess, it's probably in like the 50s or 60% or range. Okay. And, and then this one is maybe a question we can uh, talk about later, but the, um, you know, this obviously was a field experiment, but uh, in in practice, do um, do a lot of companies run these uh, promotions along with other pr promotions uh, priorities? A as in, like being uh, you know incentivizing people to run uh, right reviews, is that uh, done kind of in conjunction with other goals in mind? Um, I'm not sure. I, like, what are the other what are other types of goals that you're kind of having? So, mind? for example, if you're going to run uh, like. I, I may get promotions anyways, right? Um, because say I haven't used the platform in a while. So are these combined mm. or are these pretty well separated? Like you, you have one promotion to try to get reviews. You have one promotion to get people who haven't used the platform back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see your point. Um, so in this particular case, uh, this incentive is not sort of like jointly optimized with other incentives that are being offered to these guests. Um, you could imagine uh, a world where, yeah, like Airbnb is doing some much more sophisticated, uh, you know, kind of like thinking about all the incentives that are being offered in different parts of the website and not over incentivizing uh, certain guests. Um, I'm going to show you some results in a few slides that do show that, you know, this incentive is most effective for like particular subsets of guests, those that are really, um, you know, price sensitive, really, um, really price elastic. And so like that doesn't relate directly to your question, but I think it does suggest that like, there's some room to be more intelligent about like who you incentivize, like how much you offer them, uh, so on and so forth. And you could do that across like different parts of the website for sure. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, to sort of give a little bit more detail on the uh, design of the experiment, because this is kind of my my one slide and it's um, a little bit underspecified. So um, so treated uh, guests or guests to treated listings were offered this coupon. Um, guests to control listings were not offered a coupon, but at the same moment that, you know, the eight to nine days that treated guests were offered the coupon, um, hosts, uh, or sorry, guests to uh, control listings did receive a reminder email. So we we sort of are trying to, you know, remove the effect of the reminder and really isolate the effect of the coupon um, in particular. Um, what you're seeing over here on the left is just uh, an example of an email that was sent to a guest after they had completed um, that incentivized review. So, you know, as promised, they were given this $25 coupon. Um, there was a requirement that the coupon be used on a trip of $75 or more. Um, and I think that coupon needed to be used within a year, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and a, a couple of things. So we're kind of um, in this paper reusing an experiment that Airbnb ran, um, not for research purposes. This is something they were doing for product purposes. And uh, because of that, there's a couple of, um, you know, sort of strange the design decisions uh, in the experiment. So one thing that is, is a little strange, I think, is that the experiment ran for about two years. Um, and, you know, it ends up being the case that this was not purposeful. I think this experiment was started and then uh, was just running for a while and, and no one really realized that it was running, um, which ended up being very useful for us because we were able to observe, you know, longer running uh, treatment effects and collect a really large sample. Um, and the uh, this intervention was developed with the hypothesis that, you know, getting that first review would be particularly helpful 
for listings that had not gotten a review yet, that it would lead to a lot of subsequent bookings. And that's why the uh, the treatment focuses specifically on listings that do not have any prior reviews. Um, if you're wondering about this kind of, you know, uh, no guest review within eight to nine days, um, this is because both the reminder emails and the incentive emails were sent um, using Airbnb's overall email dispatch system. And there's a, a little bit of variation in terms of when the emails get batched and sent out, um, in addition to the fact that there's some differences with time zones and things like that. So, um, you know, the, the variation in the timing is essentially random, and that is kind of the source of the variation in that timing. Um, before I move on, just want to pause here. Any other questions about the experiment design? Yeah, David, can I ask one yes. question? Yeah. Here, you are focusing on the uh, listing with no prior reviews. But I think that will lead to some selection, right, in terms of listings. Um, yes. Uh, so because the experiment is running for such a long period of time, I think, yeah, there's a mixture of listings that have been sitting on the platform maybe for a while and have been unable to get a review. So that leads to some of the selection that you're thinking about. Um, but you can also imagine that over time, uh, you know, like I don't know off the top of my head, like the churn rate of Airbnb listings, but generally nowadays, if you try to search for a listing that was on the website in 2014, many of them are gone. So we're also just getting a lot of new listings that are cycling, uh, cycling onto the site. Um, I also think to your question, uh, it, it relates a little bit to something that I'm going to uh, discuss later on when sort of contextualizing our results, which are that um, it turns out to be the case that uh, most of the Airbnb markets during this time period of uh, rapid growth, so 2014 to 2016, are um, quite supply constrained. And so um, there's very few listings that are just sitting there for a long time, uh, unable to get like any reviews or, or any bookings, like, like generally, especially on high demand nights, kind of everything can get booked. And so I haven't looked in the data, but my suspicion is that, you know, I, I don't think there's like these listings in our sample that are getting booked over and over and over again and not getting reviews. I, I think there's a different selection problem, which is that, like I said, there's this one requirement, that the listing has to have been booked. So you can imagine that there are these really, you know, truly unappealing looking listings that just, you know, maybe don't have any pictures or like don't have a description or anything like that. And those listings are not going to appear in our sample. So I think that's also, um, if anything, uh, kind of like, I think the more um, important sort of selection dynamic that's happening. Yeah, and also to follow up on your point is that, so the listing with no prior reviews on average seems to be new listings, right? They're in general, like, new listings and then yeah. there are results saying that even for those new listings without like public information the reviews are not that like informative in terms of removing asymmetric information uh so this is a pretty uh, i think pretty uh, like big for, for me yeah yeah exactly i mean i i think there's a lot of reasons that explain why this is the case so i think we we try to be really careful in the paper of saying you know this is not to say that the like reviews are never useful. I, I think a lot of it has to do with market conditions and design choices on Airbnb. But I, I do think the takeaway is that in any setting, you would expect, you know, your prior would be that the biggest effect would be for the subset of listings that are new and stand to benefit the most from, you know, a marginal piece of information. So I, I do think it's like, insofar as there's some of this selection happening, the selection is in a direction that that kind of like helps us as opposed to hurting us. Okay. Hey, uh, hey David, uh, following Shijia's question, um, I could imagine for those listings, the host will actually try to encourage or incentivize the uh, uh, consumers to leave reviews themselves, right? I guess that's unavoidable for the platform. Uh, sorry, what was the last the last point? Uh, I mean, whether the host uh, invite the uh, invite the consumer to review. Uh, it's our global task, right? We just don't know. That may be confounding to the platform is is um invitation, right? Yeah. Um. At least in the Airbnb context, um, there's not an official mechanism for the host to be able to, uh, like monetarily incentivize the review. I mean, there's there's no way to know. I mean, I guess it's possible that when they meet in person, you know, the host says like. 
here's $20, uh, leave a good review. Um, but there's no way to enforce on their part that they get the review or that the review is good. Um, and for the most of the duration of, um, for most of the duration of the experiment, uh, Airbnb is using the uh, sort of like simultaneous review mechanism that we look at in our other paper where both guests and hosts can't see the review that they've been left until they write their own review. So we know that for most of the sample, it's not the case that the hosts are, you know, leaving positive reviews of the guests to try to induce positive reviews. Um, I think there's also, I mean, one thing you could think about is that there's also the possibility of some sort of endogenous pricing behavior on, on the host part. So when they're a new host, they sort of price low uh, in order to get a high review then maybe they, um, you know, would, would get an equilibrium at their sort of like typical price. Um, but the, the guest kind of takes that into account. Um, I don't know that we have anything in the paper that looks at that, but we do look at whether there are any pricing changes on behalf of the host subsequent to getting the review. So we kind of say insofar as these reviews are not, you know, seemingly increasing market efficiency, is that because of something related to host price changes in response to the reviews that are left? Um, and we don't see much evidence for that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for the questions. Really appreciate the, uh, these are all great questions. Um, all right, so to move on. Um, so, all right, so uh, to sort of give a roadmap uh, for what I'm gonna show you, and I'm to sort of give you a, a slightly more zoomed out roadmap, I'll first show you the, uh, the experiment results, which are how does the treatment intervention that I've just described um, affect reviewing behavior, but then also subsequent market outcomes, which um, as I mentioned is kind of the, uh, you know, the blind spot of the previous papers in this literature. Um, and then once I've done that, uh, I'm going to spend some time kind of digging into why we think we have the results that we have, because uh, as has already kind of come up in conversation, these results are um, a little bit counterintuitive. And so um, we did a lot of digging to try to understand what are the mechanisms that explain the fact that we do not see any uh, positive impact on any of these market outcomes that we look at. So uh, the first thing that we do is we look at the effect of the incentivized review um, program on the reviewing behavior of guests. And what we see is, um, I think, exactly in line with most people's priors. Um, it's exactly in line with previous research that has looked at this type of thing. So um, we see, uh, in general, that the review incentive induces additional reviews and that those reviews are more negative on average. So, you know, the first thing that we see is that if you look at the difference between uh, control and the incentivized review treatment in terms of just how many people are not leaving a rating at all, um, the review rate increased in the treatment group by uh, about 12.86 percentage points. Um, remember that we're conditioning on, you know, having not left a review uh, in the first eight to nine days. And so if you just look, you know, how big is this increase relative to the baseline review rate in the control group? Um, it's a, it's an increase of, um, you know, a, it's a, it's a pretty sizable increase. Um, but then if we look at the effects conditional on the reviews, so this is basically asking, you know, what's, how does the average review score move? Um, we find that the average rating, uh, left by guests drops by, uh, about 0.07 stars in the five star system. And you can kind of see where that's coming from, uh, in this kind of, uh, conditional distribution that I'm showing you here. So the, uh, percentage of five star reviews goes down. Um, and then the percentage of uh, four and three star reviews goes up. I think that the the two star effect I'm showing you here is also um, statistically significant according to some conventional thresholds, but it's it's a really tiny effect. And then we don't see any uh, stat sig difference on the one star rate, which is really low to begin with. So um, not a lot of power there. Um, I don't have it in this slide, but we also do some uh, NLP to look at differences in the review text that people leave uh, in addition to the star ratings. And we also find that the uh, that the text becomes more negative on average in the treatment group. So uh, totally consistent with what we are um, seeing in the star ratings. So um, this is the effect of the incentive treatment on uh, reviewing behavior. Um, now you might kind of uh, think, you know, how much of this is about um, selection versus changes in actual reviewing behavior amongst the same set of guests. And so one thing that we do is we try to look at differences in the uh, observable covariates of stays that are reviewed in both treatment arms and then reviewed and not reviewed 
um, in the treatment group. And so uh, this first panel that I'm showing you is just comparing reviewed stays in the treatment group versus reviewed stays in the control group. And so you can see that the, the stays that get a review in the treatment, so you can think of like, you know, any differences are basically telling you things about the mass of stays that uh, got those, you know, uh, incentivized reviews, um, were to smaller places, shorter trips, um, stays that had less value, and um, more likely to go to these, uh, what we call multi-listing hosts, so Airbnb hosts who manage uh, multiple different listings simultaneously. And so um, one way to sort of interpret this bundle of results, I think, is uh, to say that what the incentive is effective at doing is inducing reviews from uh, high price elasticity, um, you know, price conscious travelers. So it's people whose focal stays were, um, were less expensive uh, on average. And so, you know, if you imagine um, what the incentive actually is, which is a $25 USD coupon, um, a lot of stays in Airbnb are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Um, it's not that big of an incentive. And so the folks that are going to be responsive to it are, are going to be pretty, um, pretty tight with their money. Um, we also then look at the difference between treatment reviewed and treatment unreviewed. And uh, similarly, we see that even in the treatment group, those folks that are induced to leave those marginal reviews are um, have stays that are less expensive on average to smaller places. Uh, shorter trips, uh, so on and so forth. Um, one thing that we see here, which we don't see in the contrast between the treatment reviewed and the control reviewed, is that folks that are induced to leave the coupon are um, much less likely to have left a customer complaint. So I think the way that we interpret these two sets of results is that you know the incentive is effective at inducing these low budget travelers, um, even in the treatment group, there are um, there are people that are not induced to review, and those are the people that are not very low budget amongst the treated group, and that for those folks who have really maybe particularly bad stays, um, so those who are um, having an Airbnb stay that results in a customer complaint, um, they are not leaving reviews even when offered the incentive. And so I think if you're thinking about the incentive as trying to increase the review rate, but also reduce all these different types of bias that I outlined in that introductory slide. Um, this is kind of telling you that the treatment's getting you part of the way there as designed, um, but it's selecting out a very particular subset of guests. And there's a lot of bias remaining even amongst you know, the subset of guests that you do select out in the treatment group. Um, all right, so the next thing that we looked at is what effect do these incentivized reviews actually have on listings? So do these actually improve um, you know, demand uh, for the listings that are treated. And so um, the first thing we do is we just do uh, sort of like an intent to treat analysis. So we don't worry about whether or not the incentive actually induced a review uh, for a particular listing, but we just ask if you were uh, a listing that was in the treated group as opposed to the control group, after 120 days, um, was there any statistically significant increase in any of these different business outcomes? And what we see is that there is an increase in the number of listing views. So these are um, product detail page views, um, and also an increase in the number of uh, reservations that a listing receives. But if you look at uh, the business metrics that are arguably most consequential for a platform like Airbnb, uh, so those would be the total number of nights that are booked on the platform, and also the um, aggregate booking value, so the um, amount of money that the host was able to make, and um, as a consequence, you know, the, the volume of fees that the platform was able to collect, um, we do not see any kind of statistically significant increase in these two metrics. And so uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, kind of digging into how could it be the case that reservations go up but um, total nights and uh, booking value don't move at all. And um, our best uh, interpretation is that the types of you know, reservations that the listings receive um, actually change. And uh, these are more reservations for shorter stays. And so it sort of perfectly offsets things so that you don't get any more nights or um, any more booking value. So um, this is the intent to treat, obviously, uh, but we can look at the effect of the incentive for the set of listings for whom the incentive actually induced a review. Um, so this is kind of a, an instrumental variables type analysis um, that has you know, um, certain assumptions baked into it in terms of the, uh, the incentive not actually uh, changing reviewing behavior on behalf of the guests, but just kind of like inducing the review that they were or were not going to leave. Um, and if we do that uh, sort of IV style analysis, 
uh, even you know for those uh, compliers, so to speak, um, we still see uh, you know an increase in the number of listing views and the number of reservations, but do not see um, a stat sig increase in the number of uh, nights that the listing is able to um, sort of accumulate or the um, aggregate booking value for the listing. And uh, to show you, you know, I'm showing you here the 120 day uh, time horizon, but um, you know, I can kind of show you what this looks like over time as well. So um, on the top here, uh, you're sort of seeing the um, intent to treat effect, or um, another way to put that is just the effect of the coupon being offered at all. Um, on the bottom, you're seeing the effect of the review itself. So that's basically the, um, the local average treatment effect or the um, effect on the compliers. And uh, these different colors uh, show you the impact on these different outcomes. So views, transactions, nights, or booking value. And then I'm showing you uh, the effect as measured um, after different amounts of time have elapsed. So seven days, 14 days, 30, 60, 120, 180, and 360. And um, what you'll see, uh, you know, the way I would sort of tell the story of what's in these charts, and it's kind of the same, both for the, the local average treatment effect and for the um, intent to treat, is that um, we never see a stat sig effect on uh, nights or booking value. We do see those um, statistically significant effects that I showed you in table form uh, for views and transactions uh, after, you know, like four, 30 days. So it takes some time for these effects to kind of emerge, um, but they do not show up right away. And in fact, uh, they eventually kind of go away. So insofar as there are these uh, increases in the number of views and the number of transactions, um, they seem to be short-lived. And uh, we, we do some work to try to understand, you know, why, why is this happening? Um, why is there an increase in views and transactions? And, um, and our best guess is that this is due to um, Airbnb's search algorithm kind of uh, pushing these listings higher up in search as a result of the fact that they have um, at least one review. But it doesn't actually lead to any kind of um, stat sig increase in the amount of money that those listings are able to um, to collect, um, so th these are kind of the um, you know the the effects on demand. Um, so, David, why? Yeah. Uh, can I ask one question regarding the cost side? So, how much mm -hmm. money does Airbnb really spend on on each treated listing? Yeah. Um, so, how much money did Airbnb spend? So. Uh, I can tell you, we were not able to report um, exact numbers in the paper, and so I, I can't uh, it, like yeah. report an exact number here. But the um, the cost is non-trivial. So I think the total cost of this program, like all in, taking into account that you know not everyone left the incentivized review. Like even so, the redemption rate is uh, is not one hundred percent for the coupons, um, so on and so forth. Um, Airbnb still spent. Uh, hundreds of thousands of, of dollars um, giving out these incentivized reviews. So it was um, a pretty costly program uh, and, you know, for, for basically no, no gain <laughs> here. Yeah, so, I mean, here, you know, yeah. Yeah. Here, I think it's, it's maybe the, the reason why the booking value is insignificant is due to the, the size of the treatment, right? Maybe on average for each, each trade listing, the the money they spend to gain the review is not that large. So basically, you get a like insignificant like uh, impact on the booking value. But if you increase the increase the size of incentive, maybe you can start to get get a more more pronounced effect booking value. Well, I, I think the effect here is kind of independent of the size of the incentive because I mean I guess. That's not true. I, I think the way that it would affect things is the larger the incentive, the more uh, the more you're going to and the more reviews you're going to induce, and then the bigger effects that you'd expect to see. But I think if that story were true, you'd expect that the intent to treat estimate would be non statistic. But you should at least for the uh, you know for the late like for the compliers, you should see a big effect. So once you like get rid of all the noise of um, people not leaving the review, you should see large effects. And that's not what we see. Um, so even, even when a review is left, uh, we don't see any increase in booking value. Because, you know, the way that this intervention was designed, um, you know, it's only for uh, listings that don't have any prior reviews. So once you get that first incentivized review, 
then you're no longer like that particular listing is no longer uh incent like we're not airbnb was not incentivizing guests to review that listing anymore so it's really just like once the listing has that first review no more incentives um th there's a separate question i think which maybe is um like implied by your question which is like imagine that the uh the treatment intervention here were not uh, an incentive for one review but you were just kind of like incentivizing reviews in a more persistent way um, and that might be, you know, that might actually lead to bigger booking value effects, but also would be much more costly uh, for the platform. So, you know, we, we didn't run that experiment, um, but I think it's an interesting question. It's an empirical question. Um, I saw that there was a hand raised. Oh, yeah. Hi, David. This is Andrew from Lohan. Uh, Andrew. I have a question. I think the maybe the result is reflect quite efficient market outcome, because if you see the difference between transaction nights, the more first review uh, indeed in, induce more views and transactions. But if really, if it's really a random uh, two group, then they're in the end, the value and nights will be more likely to determine the fundamentals. And if the group two groups are same, that means even more viewers, more people come, but eventually if they find that, okay, so this is uh, lower than my expectation. I may stay fewer nights. And that make probably that means in the end, the market is still efficient. Yeah. yeah. Even no, you, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, no, point. thanks for the question. So I, I think what your question is getting at, and um, so there's there's one question, right, which is that does the, do the incentives induce additional demand for the listings? And, and hopefully, you know, in showing you these results, I've convinced you the answer is no. And I, I think what your question is getting at is that, okay, even if, um, you know, there's not additional demand, really, um, it might be the case that efficiency has been increased in some way, like maybe yeah. the matches that are being made are better or something like that. Um, and yeah. in a few slides, I'll, I'll show you some results on that, that show that it seems like the matches that are made are worse. <laughs> um, and so let me show you those results and then, um, happy to talk more about this if, if you still have questions, cause I, I think it's kind of a surprising result. So happy to talk more about it. Um, great. So before getting into that, so before I, uh, sort of get to Yingju's oh. question, you know, oh yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that, uh, this might not be the result that uh incentivized reviews are not helpful it might be related with airbnb's mechanism to list the products so uh i'm thinking that um since we are selecting non-reviewed properties to get treated so those properties are perhaps new or are located in places where people are less traveled so well it because they are new, and when Airbnb are trying to decide which property should be, uh, should should be seen by potential customers, then they have a mechanism to to make sure that new properties get exposed, right? So, but when they have a re review or when they have a certain amount of conversion, I mean, people reviewed the properties and people really reserve the property for after a while, then the Airbnb is going to change the way to order the properties after the search, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and in this way, then the mechanism completely changes from a new property to the, um, to the uh, mature property uh, in terms yeah. of no, how um, they are determined to display. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. I think it offers like a perfect segue to my next point. So let me show the next slide and then let's see if that answers your point, which I think is a good one. So you might ask, you know, why don't we see any increase in demand? And one thing that's true, which I think gets to Ching's question a little bit, is that it turns out to be the case that what these incentivized, like what the incentivized review program is doing is it's essentially speeding up the time to first review, right? So even in the absence of an incentive, um, maybe that stay where the incentive was offered, uh, we call it in the paper, the focal stay, uh, maybe that that stay does not result in a review, but that listing can get booked again and we'll have subsequent opportunities to accumulate reviews, right? And um, for a variety of reasons, both the fact that Airbnb uh, is pretty supply constrained at the time of this experiment, and also maybe the Ching's point, 
you know, new listings are boosted up in search. Um, you know, a lot of listings don't just get one booking. Uh, they they often, you know, like a host would have created a listing and they would have made, um, you know, they have multiple bookings lined up in the first few days. And so one thing that we find is that, um, you know, this incentive is really just speeding up the amount of time to that first review. And if you look at the difference in terms of the, the you know, how much more quickly does that first review arrive, it's really only coming, I think, about six days earlier on median. So if you look at the difference between the median, uh, you know, time to first review in the treatment group and median time the first review in the control group, uh, there's not a whole ton of speed up. So if you think about it, um, conditional on the reviews being the same, all we're really doing is saying these listings get reviews um, six days earlier. And so you wouldn't expect there to be a super large treatment due to a review just being available six days earlier. Um, another thing is that the treatment effect that we see on first reviews, uh, if we or let, let me rephrase. So everything I've been showing you, like these treatment effects way back here, are treatment effects on these focal reviews, right? So the review to uh, in response to the incentive. But it turns out that these listings can get booked again after that focal stay, and they have subsequent opportunities to receive a first review. And so if we look at the overall impact, not just on focal reviews, but on first reviews, including subsequent stays, which in which they might not be offered the incentive if the if the subsequent guest just leaves a review very, very quickly, um, all the effects that I showed you become attenuated, right? So the decrease in five-star ratings is less pronounced. The increase in four, three, and two-star ratings is less pronounced. And so this dynamic, the fact that it's not just those very first incentivized reviews that are, but also subsequent reviews that the listing might get, um, it, it kind of like decreases the potential treatment effect because all those differences in the types of reviews are, are smaller. So there's this thing that there's like a, it's really a timing story. The timing delta is not that big. The delta in the types of reviews that were induced um, is not as big as it looked initially. Um, and then there are other potential reasons for the lack of a demand effect. So um, one, and, and this goes to, again, like design decisions on Airbnb are the manner in which Airbnb displayed reviews, right? So um, at the time that this paper, the, the data from this paper uh, comes from, and I, I think uh, until fairly recently, um, Airbnb only displayed numerical reviews um, after a listing had received three reviews, and those reviews were also rounded to the half star. So insofar as this treatment intervention uh, was only targeting that first review, um, all these differences were getting further smoothed out once displayed to users in that there were two other reviews that were kind of not incentivized and were not different. Um, and then also, if the difference was such that the average difference in star ratings was only 0.07, like I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide, that might not even be visible to future guests in terms of the half star rating that they'd be shown. Um, another potential reason for the lack of demand effect is the limited capacity in this market, right? So um, it is the case that every single Airbnb listing on a given night uh, can only be booked once. And uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, for the period of time during which this experiment was run, a lot of Airbnb's largest markets were constantly supply constrained. So they were always very close to being fully booked out. And so what this means is that even if you, uh, you know, in order for there to be a demand effect, it has to happen on these marginal nights that would not have been booked in the absence of that review. And just because of the market dynamics at the time of this experiment, there were not very many of those marginal nights um, for the listings to be booked. Like most listings were just being booked out most nights that the host wanted to be booked out. So, um, you know, I, I think the story here and something that I'll discuss in a few minutes when I get to the conclusion slide is that, um, you, you know, it, it's kind of a lot of papers in this literature try to make claims about, you know, reputation systems have this effect or that effect. Or when you do this thing in a reputation system, this thing happens. When you do this other thing in a reputation system, this other thing happens. And I think one thing that we try to establish in this paper um, by doing this deep dive into this mechanism is that you can't really make these broad uh, sweeping claims about reputation systems. It actually does matter you know, how you display that review information, um, what the market conditions are, like, you know, limited capacity, uh, you know, affects both the marginal nights and that time to review things. So, you know, you kind of need to think about a reputation system 
um, with respect to the, the economic context in which it's embedded. Um, so let me pause here quickly. Any any questions on any of this? And hopefully, you know, some of these charts that I've just showed you answer a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, I know there's still the question about efficiency, and I will get to that in like, you know, one yeah. or two minutes. Yes, one small question. Is it yeah. possible to control whether a potential customer really sees the review during book during reservation? Uh, technically it's doable, but is this data yeah. available? Um, so for we know that the reviews were not visible um, until they had three. And so uh, something that we did while writing the paper, um, it did not make its way into the published paper, is we tried doing an event study type thing where we can you know sort of look at the, the, the moment when a given listing flips over from two to three and see if there's a big difference in the demand effect once you sort of have that you know review score publicly visible. Um, it was pretty difficult to do in a way that was going to be um, sufficiently rigorous to be published, but our, our kind of like first pass at it didn't seem to show anything uh, very interesting. So, I mean, mechanic, mechanically, we know when a listing has more than three reviews or fewer. And so we know like when that information would even be visible to the guests. Um, we don't know to your question, you know, we're not rolling, we're not logging the scrolling to know if they... Uh, if they dwelled on the review information or anything like that. Um, I will note that the the text of the ratings is always visible. So even before the the you know, like the rounded star ratings are shown, the text is there right away. Um, but you know, it's higher friction to see the text. It doesn't appear on search. And um, even though we find stat sig impacts on the uh, sentiment of the reviews, I mean, it's unclear to me if those differences in sentiment would really be, you know, super apparent to a reader that was not um, a really close reader of the reviews. Um, okay, so I know I'm, I'm coming up on my time limit. So let me try to get to the end and then happy to answer uh, any questions that remain. Um, okay, so like I mentioned, there's this lack of demand effects. We kind of dig into why there's no demand effects. But then you might ask, okay, even if there's no difference in demand, um, and I think this gets to the question that was asked earlier, um, you know, maybe it's the case that the, the match quality is increasing. And so we try to, we look at this, uh, the sample of subsequent stays to the, the hosts that are in our, in our experiment, right? So we say, not that focal guest, but for other guests that stayed after that initial focal guest who could have left an incentivized review or not, um, was there a uh, stat sig difference in any of these uh, measures that sort of get at transaction quality? So first we ask, is there any difference in the rate at which those subsequent guests leave a customer service complaint? Um, we don't see a stat sig uh, effect here. Um, the base rate of complaints is really low, so there's not much power here, um, so hard to say. Uh, we do see an increase, actually, in the rate at which those subsequent guests are leaving reviews. Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, I don't have anything, you know, super insightful to say about this, but it does seem like, um, you know, being in the incentivized review treatment, you are more likely to uh, get a review. Actually, I do have something interesting to say about this. So um, we, all of our analyses in the paper look mainly at focal reviews. Um, but if you didn't receive an incentivized review for that focal stay, you could get the incentive in, in future trips. We, we don't look at them in the main analysis because of endogeneity issues, but, but that is possible. And so at least some of this positive effect is coming from just like those incentives being offered um, for those subsequent trips. But I think the, um, the interesting thing is, you know, A, the star rating for those subsequent guests goes down. Um, you might think this has something to do with selection and, and matching, or, or maybe just like those guests tend to be more negative or something. But nonetheless, it does seem like the uh, quality of those stays is lower if you take the star rating as given. Um, and the last thing I'll show you, which I would argue is sort of the most compelling, is that if you look at those guests who have subsequent stays to these listings, and you ask after their stay at one of these incentivized review listings, how likely are they to uh, use Airbnb again in the future. So how many subsequent guest nights do they have after that stay at one of these treated listings? And what we find is that um, there's a statistically significant and um, you know pretty substantial negative impact on the number of subsequent guest nights. Um, and so this is like the most trustable you know, behavioral signal. Uh, these people are just using Airbnb less. Um, and this is true in the kind of basic regression model here on the left. 
Um, it's also true when we dump in um, a bunch of different controls. So we try to control for where the guest is coming from, when the stay is happening, uh, how long that stay was, and also how many guests were, um, were in that stay. So, you know, interesting thing here where we're not seeing any demand effects, we are seeing effects on match quality. And so the natural next question is, why is match quality lower? Um, why would these incentivized reviews actually be hurting the quality of the matches? Um, wouldn't we expect, you know, at, at worst, they should have a neutral effect? Um, and what we find is that it does seem like the incentivized review treatment sort of uh, increases um, review inflation. And so uh, what I'm going to show you, this is kind of the result that we have that tries to get at this, and, and it's a little bit complicated. So let me try to explain this, and if there are questions, please let me know. So we try to ask, how predictive are the reviews that are left in that focal stay of the next review that that listing will get or of all subsequent reviews. And so you can sort of see um, just interpreting this subset of uh, coefficients that I was showing you that, you know, the, the sort of constant is that you'll get a four-star review if you're, and this is when your first star review is a, a one-star review, right? Cause that's the omitted category. Um, if your first star review is a two-star review, that expectation goes up a bit. Three-star review, it's even higher. Four-star review, it's even higher. And then five-star review, um, you know, your expected next review is about 4.65 or something like that. Um, this is just the data for the stays at listings that are in the control group. And so what we do is we then uh, interact with the treatment indicator to see how this predictive uh, performance is different for listings that were in the treated group. And we see that the... Um, you know, specifically for these uh, five star and four star and three star and two star, um, the probability that your next review is a positive review is actually lower conditional on getting all these different star ratings. And that's a stat sig uh, difference for the four star and five star ratings. And so the way that we interpret this set of results is that, you know, conditional on having a particular quality of stay, and we can't observe the true quality of the stay. We can only observe the uh, the review that is left. It seems like conditional on the quality of the stay, the reviews are more inflated. So a four-star review here is corresponding to a worse stay than a four-star review in the control group. A five-star review here is corresponding to a worse stay than a five-star review in the control group. And this is true whether we look at just the next review or whether we look at subsequent reviews, um, whether we include covariates or whether we don't. And so this result seems pretty robust, and it seems to suggest that even though the absolute value of low star ratings is going up, uh, conditional on a review being left, if you try to actually um, figure out you know, how that relates to the actual quality of the stay, it seems like the reviews are a little bit more inflated um, due to this treatment intervention. So um, I want to just wrap up with some implications, and then we'll answer any uh, outstanding questions in the last few minutes. But um, you know, there's a few implications of this study, I think, for um, future research that looks at reputation systems. Uh, and I think I've kind of alluded to many of them throughout the talk. So um, first, uh, the market structure, the design of the reputation system, and the capacity constraints really do matter a lot. So in our setting, um, many of the effects that we see are explained by the fact that Airbnb was supply constrained, that the reviews are only shown uh, numerically when there are at least three reviews, that each listing can only be booked once. And so these things need to be taken into account when designing incentives like this, uh, designing any kind of intervention on a reputation system, and also doing research on these reputation systems. Uh, second, it's important to look beyond just the ratings distribution to understand uh, review inflation. So this is related to this last slide I just showed you. Yes, the uh, reviews left have lower star ratings, but our analysis does seem to indicate that despite that, the reviews are more inflated. Um, but, you know, uh, and then these these last two bullet points, I think, kind of get at some of the early questions here. So, you know, we're looking at this very particular type of intervention, but you can imagine other types of incentivized interventions, you know, different incentives, different sets of hosts, different sets of listings that were targeted. And those interventions very well could have different effects. So we're not trying to make any blanket claims here about the effect of incentivized reviews overall. Um, and one last thing I'll note about the particular intervention that we study 
is that you know this study uh, is conditioned, as I mentioned very early on, on the listing being able to get a review. Um, but uh, this 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 uh, intervention doesn't do anything for listings that just can't get a review at all. And so, if you're thinking about how to sort of solve the cold start problem of um, helping listings or, or sellers who can't get any transactions get that first transaction, uh, you're going to need some other type of intervention. And um, Amanda Pallas at um, Harvard, uh, her job market paper, I believe, looks at one such intervention, um, you know, run in the context of Upwork, but um, it's it's pretty costly and labor intensive to um, to do what she did. She ended up hiring a bunch of the workers herself. And so that would imply, you know, the platform hiring a bunch of workers. Um, so that's what I had. Thank you uh, so much for your time and attention and amazing questions. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, this QR code uh, will point you to the full paper. So if you'd like to get more detail than I was able to provide in this time, uh, please, you know, give the paper a read. Um, here's contact information for both myself and Andre. So if you have uh, other questions that I was not able to get to today, would love to uh, hear what you think and engage with your comments and questions. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you all so much. And uh, I'm not sure if I have time for a couple more questions, but um, if not, you know, happy to talk um, offline about anything. Yeah. Are there any questions yeah, to the speaker? Maybe you can have one or two questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a question. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I guess if um, the release decrease the gas price does not necessarily mean the efficiency come down because it could be that these listings that get reviewed uh, for the treatment actually are worse ones uh, in the platform on average. So despite the inflation of reviews, uh, actually, uh, and the other another factor is that when they uh, leave uh, point-based reviews, they may let, leave uh, worse descriptions as well. So when they actually uh, submit inflated points and uh, at the same time, they submit descriptions that help uh, consumers to, to evaluate the listings, then it could increase efficiency as well. Is, is that possible? Because this is a, um, a local equilibrium if we just compare whether these reviews increase the space of the listings. Yeah, so the, if I understand your question correctly, um, and like, let me know if I don't uh, answer it um, well. So I, I think there's two components. So I think to your point, yeah, it could be the case that the set of listings that you're listing reviews for um, is just lower, like some of the lower quality listings. And I, I think some of our analyses uh, sort of get at that. I mean, I, I think we can't isolate that um, entirely, but you know, like the fact that the um, the reviews seem more inflated or something, it, it does seem like maybe um, slightly worse listings are maybe getting reviewed. That's certainly possible. Um, and I, I think, you know, uh, maybe that's a good uh, sort of area for future research. I, I think some of those early results I showed too about the different types of listings that get reviewed in the two different, or the different types of stays that get reviewed in the different uh, subsamples kind of get at this as well. Um, and then I, I think the second thing you're asking is about the, like, what's the quality of the actual reviews that you induce? Because maybe you induce these reviews, but the reviews themselves yeah. are just worse. And I think, um, I don't know that, uh, I think this is true. Uh, this is not a result that we really talk about very much or make a big deal about in the paper. But I do think that the average length of the reviews in terms of the text that people write is shorter. So there is something to like, you know, you offer uh, the incentive and people just try to write the shortest review possible that they can write to kind of get the money. And so you can imagine, I don't know, putting some minimum length requirement on the review or something, but then, you know, people might just like hit the same key over and over again or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I mean, um, there, I've seen anecdotally, like Airbnb does this, I'm guessing a lot of platforms do this, where they've experimented with different ways to elicit review information, where they ask a series of specific questions and like collate them then into one review at the end where they'll ask like, how clean was it? Like, where was it located? Like, did it have this? Did it have that? And they just paste it all together. So I, I think there's like a separate question here, which is that in any context, but maybe especially in the incentivized context, how do you actually try to get people to leave like high quality, um, informative reviews? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, yeah, thank you very much.